we are looking again into mutation-based fuzzing. But in contrast to the last chapter, we're taking a bit more detailed look into it and notably a bit much more modular look at it. We're introducing the concept of gray box fuzzing, which is a variant of uh, mutational fuzzing, but it is much more systematic and much more elaborated by allowing us to actually parameterize many aspects of our fuzzer. First of all, what does gray box fuzzing mean? We distinguish, <clears throat> we distinguish several perspectives on a program depending on how much information we have. We do have white box fuzzing, which means we have the source code, we can execute the program at will, and we can retrieve all the information we want at will, for instance, by instrumenting it, by altering the source code. Everything is laid bare to us. We can fully look into our program at hand. This is white box fuzzing. This is actually the perspective you typically have when you're building the software yourself. Then we have black box fuzzing. Black box fuzzing means we're treating the program as a black box, out of which we have little to no information at all, except that maybe for the fact that it occasionally passes or fails a test. In black box fuzzing, black box, in black box fuzzing, um, you have no knowledge about the program code or practically no knowledge, and you also have no capabilities as it comes to the program code, so you cannot, you know, you cannot inject things or change it at will. There are, there you, see, you simply know nothing. If you do black box fuzzing or generally black box testing, what you have to work with is a specification of the input language and possibly even a specification of what makes correct behavior. Without such specifications, there is no sense in testing a, testing a black box because you need to generate inputs and you need to be able to interpret its results. Now between white box fuzzing where you have everything and black box fuzzing where you have nothing, there is gray box fuzzing. And gray box fuzzing means you do not have ever all the information as in white box fuzzing, but you also do not have no information at all. Instead, you have little information and the perspective of what little means in that context, of course, is a bit uh, open to interpretation. But um, one of these little information that, to, uh, that one can look at is notably information that is easy to gain and that is easy to get without, um, that is easy to get, meaning in the sense that um, you don't need much, and you don't need much effort, and there are generic techniques for retrieving this information. And the typical information that we are using in the context of fuzzing is coverage, namely which parts of the program have been executed. And this is easy to get. We can get this. Uh, we can get this from pretty much every um, we can get this from pretty much every programming language because pretty much every programming language has support for measuring coverage and why is that so because measuring coverage is an essential part of assessing the quality of testing if your tests have say 10 percent coverage this means that 90% of your code is not even executed during the test. And this means that your test actually is in great need to get improved because a test can only find bugs in those places which it actually executes. And therefore, pretty much every programming language, programming environment has means to gather, to gather coverage from runs. And since coverage is pretty much ubiquitous, this is also what is being used in gray box fuzzing. Now this chapter is this chapter pretty much builds on the insights that we had already from the last chapter. Namely, we are getting coverage, we are evolving a population of inputs uh, towards a target, but this time we are doing this in a more elaborated fashion, namely by making our fuzzers more parameterized uh, in the sense that we can come up with uh, various um, algorithms, we can come up with various ways to uh, direct our fuzzing towards specific locations and more. So, and these actually, and the techniques actually that we're having in here in this chapter are techniques that have been directly integrated into AFL. 
So the algorithms we're looking at here are the original algorithms as they have been realized or actually later integrated into AFL. And if you run AFL today, you're going to see some of these right in action. So uh, one more time, we're looking at uh, mutations. This time we are setting up a mutator class, which again inserts the, which again brings in our mutators that we already have seen in the last chapter, deleting characters, inserting characters, flip characters. So this is uh, pretty much the same as we have seen them before. But now we're introducing something new. This is the concept of a power schedule. What is a power schedule? A power schedule tells us how to distribute our fuzzing efforts in the population. Meaning that if I have a population of many inputs, which of these populations should get the highest amount of power, of energy, of fuzzing time, or more precisely, and or more precisely, which of these inputs should be given the highest chance to actually evolve and mutate such that we get more offspring. And um, this <clears throat> powers, this concept of a power schedule can be extremely is, is extremely important for fuzzing because this defines how efficient a fuzzer is going to be. The more efficient or the more targeted or the better a fuzzer distributes its time such that it reaches its goal, well, the higher its chances that it actually will be able also to reach these goals. And uh, for this, we assign energy to individual seeds to individual seeds in our population and we have functions for that that do precisely that originally each seed has the same energy but now we can come up with now we can come up with means to to distribute this energy better across our seeds we introduce a class named advanced mutation fuzzer which is actually now parameterized with these things so we can put in a mutator of our choice, which allows the whole thing to be extensible, such that we can put in our own mutators and we can put in arbitrary new uh, schedules in here. And um, we're doing a couple of evaluations in here. And this is also something which we can uh, extend into uh, coverage guided mutational testing, which means that we are executing the program while tracking its coverage. And this coverage can then be used to actually determine our power schedule. So um, let's get a bit further down here. Um, the first idea here is to come up with a schedule that um, to come up with a schedule that gives extra energy to paths that are not frequently exercised. We had this in our previous chapter before. Uh, if an element in our population did not add new coverage over existing elements, we ignored it. Here we do the same thing, but in a more principled way. We give, we give every element a, a schedule that is inversely proportional to the path frequency, meaning that if a path is taken a frequent amount of times, then any new seed that actually takes this path just as well gets a low energy, whereas paths that are taken infrequently only by one seed in our population, then we give this seed a higher energy. This is uh, similar to the poem, uh, The Road Less Traveled by Robert Frost. You can look this up actually. It's called The Road Less Traveled and our, um, and our hero of the poem, uh, the protagonist of the poem stands at an intersection and has the choice between two paths. One is a broad path where everybody has gone along and then there's a small winding path where nobody has trotted along. And um, so the question is, which path do you take? Which of course is a general uh, allegory in life. Are you going to go the mainstream or are you going to make your own path in life? And um, Robert Frost uh, ends the poem with, uh, I took the road less traveled though, and this made all the difference. Sure, if you're, <laughs> if you're a world renowned poet in the end, yes, of course it pays off to, write poems that not nobody else does. Um, but taking the road less traveled, 
not only it's not only it's not only an allegory in life. It's also important for fuzzers, because if we have an input that takes a path that only this particular input takes, then it's actually very useful to create more offspring of that particular input, such that along that path less traveled, we can explore more paths that go into further that go into further intersections. Because if everybody goes along the mainstream, then all the paths that uh, that start from this mainstream will also be traveled already. So we're not going to discover too many new things in there. But if some if some input has managed to find out a new path in the program, then we will let it generate more offspring. And this is precisely what we are doing here in this chapter, which is actually also um, named the AFL Fast Schedule. And this is actually implemented in current AFL versions. So that's um, that's very that's already a very nice uh, very nice. Uh, addition to mutational fuzzing. Our second addition to mutational fuzzing is the idea to direct your population towards particular locations in your code. Name, so you may have a location in your code that is particularly critical, for instance, because, uh, because it is relevant for security. It could be a potential buffer overflow. You could have something that has recently changed Code that has recently changed is more prone to errors than code that has been around in production for several years or even decades. Okay, so if you have a couple of these critical or very simple code that is not covered yet by your existing tests, obviously you want to cover these. And the idea here is that we transform our program into a so called call graph. Here's one of these call graphs. And in these call graphs, um, every these call graphs indicate um, with edges possible transitions of control from one node to the next, and each node represents a, a basic block in the program. So, and now the idea is as follows: um, Here we have. Let's assume we have a line over here uh, in call graph PI one hundred thirty-seven. Okay, and we want to get there. Okay, we want to get to this tile 30 in here. And now we have another input that gets us to tile 31 over here. But then it goes, but then it doesn't go left, it goes just down here to tile 41. Okay. And now the idea is the closer your input is, the lower the distance towards this uncovered, towards these uncovered parts in here the higher the energy you're going to give them. So in our case, an input that gets us close to the parts that are yet uncovered will get a higher energy than inputs that simply, again, trod along parts that are uncritical, trod along parts that are, that are covered already or in general, less interesting. And by giving such, um, by giving such energy to those inputs, that actually, that actually get us close to the parts that we're interested in, we again increase the chances of by applying more mutations to those inputs to actually eventually cover these. And this is the idea of directed gray box fuzzing. And uh, of course, we also have implemented this uh, directed gray box fuzzing in here. Um, we <coughs> have a particular schedule for that which is also compute. This is actually, if you also need to compute all these distances, you need to retrieve the call graph, which actually also involves a bit, involves a bit more in terms of gray box fuzzing, because at this point, you already need to be able to interpret the code at hand in order to find out where the possible branches are and all. But let's still name this gray box fuzzing, because that's also something you can do on binaries, and it's not too complicated to measure. And um, then you can create a then you can create a directed schedule that specifically targets those uh, inputs whose distance to a node of interest is low, and um, this this gets us a directed fuzzer and this gets us a directed uh, power schedule and this is something which has been implemented in the AFL variant of AFL Go, 
which is specifically tailored to which is specifically tailored to focus or to direct fuzzing towards locations of interest, be these locations that are critical or simple locations that are not covered yet. And um, all of this results in a all of this results in a pretty modular architecture. So we're having our gray box fuzzer here, and this gray box or this gray box fuzzer is parameterized with a schedule. And the schedules that we've seen can be schedules such as AFL fast schedule or AFL go schedule. And uh, we can also put in various kinds of mutators in here. We're also introducing a dictionary mutator, which on top of just applying mutations is also able to make use of a dictionary of existing strings in order to improve things. And we also have a class for seeds, which allow to assign extra attributes to individual seeds. And um, this is actually an infrastructure which allows you to experiment further by creating more subclasses, by coming up with different, uh, by coming up with different um, schedules, different formulas, different distributions on your own with little to no effort. All you have to do is then apply these on the subject of your choice to see how well they work. And who knows, maybe you're going to be the next creator of some new AFL variant, which you then, which you then, after having toyed with this in our Python infrastructure, can implement into the AFL code proper, and then maybe create the next big fuzzing tool. Uh, yep, plenty of opportunities for you here with rapid prototyping with Python. I mean, what's the, the, the alternative is to take AFL as is and to work with its C code, trying things out and finding out that they don't work. I would I rather recommend to take our Python code and to toy with this. It's much easier to use and you can even visualize the experiment results right within the Jupyter Notebook as we do too. And then if you have a hypothesis on how things should work and how things should be, then go and implement, then go after you've done the experiments on Python code, then you can go and implement this in AFL and let this run on C code of your choice. Very much looking forward to your future contributions in terms of building even better fuzzers. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye bye.